The Dream Called Love by Gerald Frost. How many people dream of love? I do, and sometimes. Oh, those precious sometimes. I wake up and write it down. For instance, once I fell in love with a girl I met in a dream. Usually it's the other way around. In every 800 word saying there must be a minimum of two threats of danger, the disheveled professor yelled, chalking two threats of blood on the board. He turned around to the class. Your grade depends upon knowing this. You better take notes. One threat is at the start of the scene and one at the end. The first threat is in the form of the present threat. The latter is in the form of omniscient. Within the body of the text, you can do whatever you like that pertains to the first threat. The first threat must occur within the first sentence or within the first 25 words of your sentences or if they're truncated because of reasons of, 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 of intensity, pacing, lack of breath, whatever. If you put a knife on the table by the door, your reader knows you'll be using that knife precisely because you place it prominently at the start of the scene. If your character notices the knife halfway through to the scene, the knife may or may not be used during the scene. Most likely it won't be used, or if it's used, it's only for trivial reasons. It's only mentioned as a background shiny point, or perhaps as a clue to a larger story. If it is noticed halfway through the scene, and used big time, you will have robbed your reader of anticipation. This anticipation is what your readers crave. It draws them into your scene. It draws them into your book. It draws their money into your pocket. Remember, your readers lead safe, boring lives. They crave what they do not have. They want excitement, but not the personal danger. Those stories are full of violence because, as a society, we are safe. But the psychology that protects us is programmed to look for threats. Our brains are programmed to look for predators and leaning dead trees. When we don't see one, our brains look farther. By providing a little safe violence, something pinned safely to a page, we help to discharge their pent-up angst. No matter what happens in the reader's life, what happens in your book or in your movie will be worse. And they know it. It isn't more exciting. If it isn't more exciting than real life, your reader will feel robbed. Now, the professor droned on. The second threat, the omniscient, occurs at the end of the scene. It is the cliffhanger that makes the reader turn the page. Suddenly, Penny notices the dreadful curved blade on the table. And just as suddenly, the scene changes to Paul careening down the rainy night streets. You know that knife is bad news, but is it bad news for the villain? Is Penny going to pick it up and stick it in his eye? Or is it bad news for Penny? Is she going to be scalped like all of the other victims? The best omniscient has ambiguity. It's a threat, but will it be carried out? Or, more precisely, at whom is it aimed? And notice that Paul is careening down the rainy night streets. Will his haste cause him to die in a fatal accident? Since this threat, Paul's desperate driving, occurs at the start of his scene, it's going to play out in his scene. He'll at least sideswipe a car that is parked. Maybe a policeman will notice and give chase. The professor paused. Actually, that would be a good device to throw more peril at Paul. Let the police siren happen at the end of Paul's scene. Will the officer follow him to Penny? Or will Paul be in handcuffs as Penny is experiencing her darkest moment? The professor points behind him at something else written on the board. Always rape and pillage before you burn the village. It could work out either way! Which makes the omniscient all the more delicious for your reader. Or the rushing police car may have nothing to do with Paul, 
and the police make people going to a robbery in progress and couldn't give a flip about this reckless driver. Unlike the first threat, the present threat, which will be dealt with quickly, the final threat is long-term. Think of the first threat as a punch in your face. It when you stagger from the impact and you get your guard up to block against the next blow. The final threat is vague. Who's it aimed at? Who's at the door? Is it the police or is it the robber's brute who was on patrol but now he wants to play with Penny? In fact, whether the threat comes at the start of the scene or at the end determines how it will be dealt with. The threat at the start of a scene is always dealt with in that scene. Never threaten at the start of a scene and not follow through. This is a rule which you can bend to keep the reader guessing, but typically you cannot break it, at least not by much. The threat starts the scene is like lightning. What the lightning touches, what it illuminates, that is where your story happens. The threat at the end of your scene, that is your thunder. That is your way of telling the reader that there will be more lightning. At this point, I wake up to the sound of distant thunder, which I'd worked into my dream. I can either get up or go back to sleep. 20 minutes until the alarm. The coffee isn't even done brewing. Figure 10 minutes to get back to sleep with no chance of another dream. Okay, I'll get up and write it down. The professor had said to take notes, so I better take the hint. Being lectured at in a dream is never fun. People pay to be lectured at like this in college, but I'm long since done with classroom nonsense. Being lectured at about threats is like double weird. On cue, the ominous thunder rolls in the background, though the sky holds not but fading stars. What does it mean? For one thing, it means the thunder clouds are mounting on the far side of my house, the view not included from the window in front of me. Mostly it means I should back up my computer. <laughs>